Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. It's uh, particularly uh, gratifying to see new faces. Uh, certainly welcome back the, the old faces. Uh, I'm gratified to see the old faces, too, but it's uh, certainly uh, gratifying. The previous faces. Thank you very much. That was an excellent point. That was an excellent point. That was an excellent point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, I also, yes, an excellent, excellent way to start. Uh, maybe you should give me the hook by now. Uh, am I also, just uh, to reiterate, but it's a very important uh, reiteration, just most certainly want to thank Stuart Rosenthal and Aaron Shalom, really, for being very much the driving force behind this series in general. Um, we're here for the Shema, but I, I would like to maybe experiment with something for a few moments and I, I would certainly welcome people's feedback, not during the time of this year, maybe after or during the week. This program that we've had, whether it be Shurim, whether it be a Shabbaton, whether it be other things, uh, humbly I think there's one thing that we've been missing, and I've sort of been trying to find the, the way, and Stuart and I have been talking about it uh, to a certain extent in our own too, kind of the, 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 the button to press. Um, and unfortunately, uh, in light of current events in Israel, I, I have a little bit of, a, of an idea. I think it will be very powerful for the people who are coming together to, to, to work on the tefillah to have something to be doing independently and yet to feel like they're doing it as part of a group. And, and uh, just this thought of, of, of having something, I don't know, a weekly thing, I'm not sure, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm certainly open to ideas after this year or during the week, uh, to have something that a person can work on in their tefillah and know that they're part of a group working on the same thing. I think there's a certain force to that. So, if, if you just bear with me for a moment, page 102 in the Arts Cross Center, this is actually something that we discussed on S Ray. And uh, the other day I was speaking in Shul about the value of very much reflecting on the situation in Israel during our prayers. I, I think there's a little bit of a mistake that people make with Tehillim. Tehillim is extremely powerful, saying Psalms is extremely potent. But I feel like people daven their same old davening. Okay, now we're going to say Tehillim for Israel, now we're going to focus. You know what, there's a lot to, to focus on in davening for the situation in Israel and many other things. So I just want to remind you of something we discussed during the Shemona Esri series, the bottom of page 102, the bracha of Re'ei Von I just want to just briefly read through the bracha and, and think of the situation in Israel as we read through this bracha. And, and what I want to just begin with is the end. The closure of the bracha is Baruch HaTah Hashem Goel Yisrael the Redeemer of Israel. We bless Hashem as the Redeemer of Israel. What do we mean when we talk about the redemption of Israel? A number of commentators explain we don't mean the ultimate redemption. There are references to the ultimate redemption, the coming of the Messiah, the building of the Third Temple. There are references to, there are references to that later in Shemot Esra. A number of commentators explain that the brach of Goel Yisrael is redeeming us from whatever calamities we happen to be in at the moment. So now, thinking about it that way, I just want to, just a, a simple translation of this bracha, and I, I think this is the most <coughs> significant bracha in Shemona Esrei to just think about, in terms of the situation in Israel. And there are other brachas that we could be thinking about, but this is a, a very powerful one to me. Re'evon yenu. See our cause, see our affliction. Furiva rivenu. And fight our fight. Ugoleinu meheral man And redeem us speedily for the sake of your name. And again, it doesn't have to be the ultimate redemption. The ultimate redemption we, we welcome also. And that should be speedily in our day. But, but and think about it, for the sake of your name, that, that here it is, so many people look at the Jews in Israel right now, whether they view us as, as uh, uh, forgive me for even saying the words, but an apartheid state, or, 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 or people who are unfair, sh sh and, and, and even within ourselves, what well, here we are, we're, 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 we see ourselves as God's chosen people, we're in God's holy land, and look at what we have to deal with. And help us from these challenges, and the very help of these challenges will in itself be a tremendous Kiddush Hashem, a tremendous sanctification of God's name. Kigoel Chazagata, you are a, a strong redeemer. Blessed out our God again, as we discussed so many times in the series, you are blessed in the sense that we recognize you as the source of all, of everything in this world, the Redeemer of Israel. So if, God willing, with God's help, the situation should clear up so quickly, we will recognize that as being the hand of God. So I, I just, I just want to propose, 
for a moment again, and if it's a terrible idea, I'm sure people will tell me. Um, uh, let's try to take on our, upon ourselves as a group one Shmon Esra a day. Not even every, every, every Shmon Esra. One Shmon Esra a day, a person should stop before they get to the Brach of Re'e Von Yenu and just think about something relevant to the situation in Israel. It could be a person that we know of that needs to be healed from an attack. It could be a specific picture that we've seen over these past days and weeks. It could be a, a specific just just concept. Could I imagine having to worry about X? It could, it could be it could be a loved one or, or a loved one of a friend who's in Israel right now. Just think about something relating to the situation in Israel. Pause for a moment, and then with that in mind, say this problem. I think again. I think it's a wonderful thing to think about, uh, just for any of us as individuals. It's actually kind of following on the footsteps of what we spoke on the other evening in Shul. The idea of doing it as a group is, I think, a very powerful thing. And let's, that'll be, you know, for, for, for us in this group, that'll be the goal for this next week. And, and perhaps if people think it makes sense, we'll have another suggestion next week. Uh, that's something to, to think about. Forgive me for taking the time, but I, I think it might be a beneficial exercise. Okay, and then, much more important, we should all be Zolka to see and hear much, much better news from Israel <coughs> very, very quickly. Okay. And the fact that we're coming together to strengthen our relationship with God and, and, and strengthen our prayers should of itself be a merit uh, that, that we should hear only good news speedily. Okay. Uh, if you want to go to the Shema, I believe that's what you came for. So uh, the Shema is on page 90. Got this in the Go Sitter. We could, we could spend so much time talking about the Shema. I, I want to just give a very general introduction. I thought also we would talk tonight about some halachos regarding the saying of Shema. It's, it's a very significant part of our tefillah. But then what I'd like to spend the bulk of time on tonight is the first paragraph of Shema. Hopefully we'll, we'll finish the first paragraph of Shema. You have my word, 9 o'clock is 9 o'clock. Don't worry whether or not we finish the first paragraph of Shema. Uh, depending on how time is going, we'll... We'll pause for comments and questions, but it depends how we're, how we're going here. Um, so as you know, there are three paragraphs of the Shema. Each of these three paragraphs come from different sections of the Torah. Um, we have a Torah mitzvah to say Shema twice a day. Now, some opinions say that this Torah mitzvah is the first two paragraphs of the Shema. Some opinions say the Torah mitzvah is the first paragraph of the Shema. Some opinions say the Torah mitzvah is the first pasuk of the Shema. Like any Jewish topic, you get many opinions. Um, but it is interesting to think about that it is really the only part of the daily prayers that we can specifically point to and say there's a Torah mitzvah to say this. That there might be very well be a Torah mitzvah of daily prayer, but specifically that God says to us, you need to say this every day, this is the only one. It, it, it's, it's, it's a very interesting point. Um, just for the purposes of clarity, um, technically speaking, being that it's a positive time-oriented mitzvah, men would have this commandment, women would not have this commandment of, of saying Shema daily, but of course, in general, women uh, very much could have the commandment of daily prayer, but specifically this technical statement of you have a Torah mitzvah to say this every day, presumably women wouldn't have an absolute obligation, but it is of course an extremely powerful point of the prayer, and it is the only part of the prayer directly from the Torah, uh, whatever one's gender. Um, there's a progression within the paragraphs of the Shema. The first paragraph of the Shema, just to be clear, what I mean when I say the first paragraph is beginning with Shema Yisrael through Uchsav Tom Amzuzos Pesecha Visharecha, which is the end of the first paragraph on the next page. Um, this first paragraph is what's considered to be the acceptance of Ol Malchu Shemayim, the yoke of heaven. Um, it'll come out in a very clear way as we proceed through the first paragraph. Um, the second paragraph is much more about acceptance of the mitzvos and understanding that if we don't, uh, I'm sorry, if we do God's mitzvos, let's be more positive, if we do God's commandments, uh, we'll receive great reward, and if we don't, heaven forbid, there, there will be repercussions. We'll talk about that much more next week, God willing, you know, what that means exactly. And the third is, is a little bit of a curveball when you think about it with fresh eyes, which is the third is all about the tzitzis, the mitzvah of tzitzis. But what's most significant about it in terms of why it's part of our daily prayer is there's very strong reference to the fact that God took us out of Egypt. 
and, and, and very strong reference to the fact that since God took us out of Egypt, it's incumbent upon us to serve us and to serve him in the appropriate manner. But according to many opinions, it's really the first two paragraphs of Shema that are the most central uh, to what this, is, what this is really all about. Um, just an interesting thing to think about in general. Why in the world should we have to say Shema twice? You know, God, do you want me to say Shema every day? I'll say Shema every day. Why, why do we have to say Shema? And it's, it's based on the passage that we'll see tonight. He says, when you rise up, when you lay down, uh, so there's a concept of Shema of the morning and Shema of the evening. Most mitzvot that we do, are one, certainly on a Torah level at least, are, are once a day and, and, and not, not more. It's an interesting thing. There's a Torah mitzvah of Kiddush only once over a Shabbos. We have the practice of, uh, there's actually no Torah obligation to have potato kogel, I just want to clarify that. But uh, we, rabbinically, the rabbis came and said, you know, you should do it twice. And yet here, Shema, the Torah says, you know, say it twice. So the Avudraham has a very interesting thought. The Avudraham says that one of the core ideas of Shema is the recognition that everything is from God and that no other force in this world compares to God's dominion over this world. And therefore, which of course we emphasize with Hashem, Hashem Echad, God is one, which one of the classic understandings of God is one is there's not multiple deities in this world and it's, it's God and only God. So there's actually a power of emphasizing both in the morning and at night, at both times of day, we believe that God has complete dominion. Whereas theoretically, someone could come along and say, well, you know, maybe at night God runs the show. You know, or maybe in the morning God runs the show, but perhaps at other times uh, there are other gods. So therefore, the Abu Dram suggests that's why we say it in the morning and night. That at two very different times, we emphasize God's dominion. Uh, maybe more homiletically, one could say or think about the idea, we've said this in other contexts, that the morning represents a time where things are going very smoothly and very well, the sun is shining, uh, the night and darkness very much represents challenges in our life. And to be able to say it's all from God, and we believe God controls it all, at both junctures, just thinking about it homiletically, it's, it's, it's a powerful thing to reflect on. Okay. Um, a little more on the technical side, there's an interesting point here. Uh, well, you know, the, the, the rabbis instituted a penalty for not coming to shul. Uh, if, you, if you don't come to shul, you have to say Kael Melech Naaman at the beginning. If you come to shul, you don't have to say Kael Melech Naaman. If, if, you know, it's, it, it must be must be like you have to say Good morning, Rabbi. Yes, they mean. I don't know. Like you know, if, if you didn't, if you weren't at shul, you said Kael Melech Naaman. God is the faithful God. If, if, what's this all about? It's a very interesting idea we have. Uh, Traditionally, in rabbinic literature, there's an idea that there's uh, 248 uh, limbs to the, to the body, limbs, and uh, if you count up the words of Shema, including Baruch Shein, that, that line immediately following the Shema, you get to 245. And the, 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 the rabbis like the idea of having 248 words of the Shema, that if we uh, look with great diligence and devotion towards God, and our relationship with God is reflected in the Shema, then God would protect us in all ways, and in all aspects of our body. And therefore, they like the idea of the Shema having 248 words. So if you're in Shul, so everyone says the Shema to themselves, and then you hear the Chazan say at the end, Hashem Elokeichem Emes, those are three words, Hashem Elokeichem Emes. So you live vicariously through the Chazan's repetition of those three words, you're at 248. If you're not in Shul, uh, so you don't have that repetition. And therefore, Keol Melech Ne'amon, God is a faithful God, so you get to 248. That's just the technical idea there. By the way, Kel Melech Ne'amon also spells out Amen. Uh, so, so it's essentially something, let's say, missing from not being able to, let's say, respond to another person's bracha that you get to when you're in Shul. Okay. Um, what maybe we'll do, I, I think I've said my fill of technicals for the moment. Uh, maybe we'll do is we'll, we'll focus on the meaning of the first paragraph of Shema, and if there's time at the end, we'll get into some of the technical halachos, and maybe we'll split up the technical halachos over the course of these three weeks. Okay. Uh, we're so used to this pasuk. Uh, again, this pasuk is such a powerful pasuk. Uh, forgive me for saying it, but I think what's even more powerful than the words is how we look at this pasuk. Famously, throughout the generations, Jews who have been on the verge of losing their lives uh, because they were Jews, or 
Kiddush Hashem, dying by the sanctification of God's name, or heaven forbid, even not, in that circumstance, just in terrible danger. Traditionally, I've said this Pasuk, whether a Pasuk as, as, as a, a way to confirm one's firm belief in God, no matter what's about to happen, whether it be as, as beseeching God to help at this moment of despair, Shema Yisrael Hashem Lokeinu Shalachad. Such a part and parcel of who we are as a people. Uh, famous stories uh, in the aftermath of the Holocaust. Uh, the rabbi going from, from church to church and walking in and just saying that one Pasuk and seeing how the children respond and seeing which one of these children had been raised as Jews and then had been hidden by neighbors and had forgotten the Judaism. An amazing thing. This is so core to who we are as a people. But thinking about the Pasuk for a moment, there are many questions one could pose on this Pasuk. Shema Yisrael. Hear Israel. Who's Israel? And, and who am I speaking to right now? Last I checked, my prayer is between me and God. So we have to understand that. One question. Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Three different names of God. By the way, two different names of God used three different times. What's your point? What, just to, to decide. You want to call him Hashem? You want to call him Elokeinu? Do whatever you want. And, and why do you have to say Hashem twice? And what does it mean that he's one anyway? What, is, what does that mean? So, again, we could spend the night on, on this Pasuk, but let's just try to say a few approaches. Um, the Sefer Hamin Hagos suggests that this verse, that the focus of this verse is, whenever we say this, we're saying this to ourselves and to whatever other Jews may be in, 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 the, in, in range that can hear us. So Shema Yisrael. To whatever Jew can hear me right now, and obviously I need to reflect on it myself, I, I, I proclaim to whoever is around Maybe it's just myself. That's what the Sefer Amenhago says. The Rebbe Yonah says that this is Shema Yisrael. This is a person. Yaakov, Jacob. Uh, well, we'll get into this a little bit later, but there's a very famous message that when Yaakov was about to die and he had his the sons gathered around him, he wanted to reveal to them what would happen in the end of days, and then he kind of fogged, and he thought this was a sign that maybe one of his children was not appropriate to share this with. And the real answer was it wasn't appropriate to share this at all, not, not because there was a lacking in his, in his offspring, but he became very concerned for a moment. And so therefore, as one, they proclaimed Shema Yisrael, not Yisrael the people, Yisrael, but this individual whose name was changed to Yisrael, here, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, that we all believe in God. So the Rebbe Yonah says that we're still referring to that. That when we say the Pasuk, and it's a powerful thing to think about, that the idea is that, I mean, by the way, we refer to ourselves, as, as, as so many times in Hebrew literature, refer to ourselves as B'nai Yisrael, the children of Yisrael, Klal Yisrael, uh, the group of Yisrael. So you could certainly understand Yisrael as being a reference to this individual. And we see ourselves, we see, similar to what we said in Shemona Esri, we see our relationship with God as being a continuation of, of this relationship that our forefather Jacob had. Interesting thing to think about. Now, what do we mean when we say hear? So the Rashba says that hearing could be one of three things, and presumably it's all of the above. So one of them is to hear me. Can you, can you hear me in the back? That's one possibility. Um, the next meaning is reflect on what I'm saying. We even we talk this way, we speak this way a little bit. Do, 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 you, do you hear me? I mean, it's a little, little bit informal, but we, we, we speak that way too. Reflect on what to think about it. And finally, he says, Shema could also be a language of acceptance. Not just thinking, but accepting. It's a very famous pasuk. Shema b'ni musar avicha v'yalti tosh torasi mecha. Hear, my son, the teachings of your father, and do not cast aside the teachings of your mother. But here it doesn't just mean hear it. It doesn't even just mean think about it. It means accept it, live with it. So we're saying all of the above. 
hear what I'm saying, <coughs> think about what I'm saying, and, and, and make it part and parcel of your belief system. And that's Shema Yisrael. Um, Rabbeinu Bachya says that the reason why we introduce this idea with the language of Shema here is the points that are going to be made in this Pasuk, which we still haven't really elaborated on, we'll get there, the points being made on this Pasuk are so profound and so essential that we have to preface it with Shema. Here, what I'm about to say, you need to really think about this. If you don't think about this, you're missing the boat. And who can say that they really fully internalize the concept? And even if I feel I, I really fully internalize the concept, who can testify that I internalize the concept? So there's only one being who can testify that I really internalize this concept, and that's Hashem. Hashem. And Rabbeinu Bachia says a very interesting thing. It's even reflected in the Siddur here. The last letter of the word Shema is an ayin. It's large, it's, and that's that way in the Torah also. It's, it's in large print. The last word of Echad, that God is one, is a Dalit. It's in large print. So you have a large ayin and a large Dalit. Rabbeinu Bachia says, as I say Shema, I'm also asking God to be my aid, my witness, that I reflect on this idea, and, and I'm really trying to make this idea part of who I am and how I think. And he, says, he suggests that's why there's a large I and a large Tao. It's an interesting thing to think about. Okay, so we're, we're saying that this is a, a profound point that requires great reflection. We're saying that we we're trying to follow in, in the path of generations of Klal Yisrael, but what are we actually saying? Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, what in the world does that mean? Okay, so Rashi says that, maybe it just to preface for a moment, Hashem is, 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 is not a, um, a personal way to refer to God. In other words, Hashem, it's, he's the master, he's not my master, He's not your master, he's the master, such as the master of the universe. It's, very, it's a very not personal label. Elokeinu doesn't mean Lord. Elokeinu means our Lord, right? We could have said Elokim, the Lord. It's our Lord, so it's extremely personal. So Rashi says the pshat in the Pasuk is, right now the master of the universe, Hashem, is Elokeinu. Is our God. So, so much of mankind does not recognize him as a deity, as the deity, but we do. But the day will come where that very same Hashem, where this very same master of the universe will be, Echad, will be the only God in the world, meaning the only God recognized by the world. So right now, it's only clear to us, obviously many others too, but there are many people who don't recognize the monotheism of the world, but the day will come where all will recognize it. That's how he understands the passage. Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Okay? Um, Rabbi Yona says that a part of the point being made here is Hashem, this great, powerful master of the universe, is Elokeinu, is our God. Uh, this is a point we discussed, I, I think, in the last series, it's very nice to talk about the fact that God is so powerful and, and think of how God created the world and think of the miracle of nature. Amazing. Are you going to get up in the morning and dive chakras or not? Which one? Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so uh, I was not specifically towards you, Mark. <laughs> but uh, there's Hashem Elokeinu. He's great. He's powerful. He's wonderful. But he's also my God, our God. And, and it, it obligates something. He's my master. Point the Rabbi Yona makes. Um, there's another aspect of the name Hashem, and that is there's a famous idea that Hashem, that this this yud hey vav and hey spelling that we have here, could connote haya, hove biyev. He was, he is, and he will be. And so many times when we use this name, it, it's, it's, it's a manner of emphasizing that God was the one who created the world. 
So Hashem, meaning he, he's, he was the first in this world. Haya, emphasize the fact that he was. He was, but he's Elokeinu. He is our Lord. In other words, he still runs my life. So he, he, he was the creator of the world, he is presently my God, and similar to what we said previously, Hashem Echad, the day will come where all of the world will recognize him as being one, as being the only one. So according to the Chizkuni, the idea is we're emphasizing the past, present, and future of God as this sole force in the world. So again, just to, just to sum up, we basically have two and a half approaches. One approach is Hashem Elokeinu, that we view him as our God, and they will come where he's a chad, where all will view him as, as the only God in this world. And the other general approach that we have is, was the creator of the world, is currently our Lord, and ultimately will be viewed by all as the total uh, dominion of the world. Um, okay, now another approach to this idea of Echad being one. So the only thing we've mentioned so far is all we recognize him as the only God. Another approach is that which the Rabbi Yona says, which is of all the things, it's a variation of this, of all the things in the heaven and the earth, north, south, east, west, he's the only force. And some of you might have seen before, it's always interesting, who knows what other people are doing during Shema, if your eyes are covered. But, uh, but you know, maybe in hidden cameras. Uh, some people they have the practice, not common, and I'm not recommending it, some people have the practice of sort of moving their head around a little bit during Shema. I don't know, I don't know if anyone's ever seen that, or if anyone will admit to ever seeing that, I'm not sure. Um, next series will be what's really going on during Birch HaSkanim, when everyone is allegedly going to come. But, um, but so that, that's this idea of the Rebbein Riona, is, is, that's what that's coming from. from. All these aspects of the world, God is dominion over all of it. Um, there's a Sefer, Milchames Mitzvah, who explains that what we mean by Echad is, is not that everyone will recognize that he's the only one, it's that he is the only force in this world. Everything. Again, obviously, there, there, there are the laws of nature. Obviously, there's the concept of free will. All these questions are powerful questions, but it's all because it's frameworks that he created and he allows to exist. It's all about God. And the Muhammad Smitzvah actually says, you know, you might wonder, why doesn't the passage just say, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Echad? Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. So he says, if the passage would say, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Echad, you know what it would sound like? Our God is only one God. Other nations? Yeah, they probably have multiple gods. We, we're only controlled by one God. Other people have multiple gods controlling them, or another God controlling them. So therefore, that's why we come back to Hashem. The only, the creator of the world is one. There's no other force in this world. So we now have basically two approaches to understanding Yechad. One is that all will recognize that there's only one God. The other is that there's only not about all recognition, but, but there's only one force in this world. Um, if I could just make one or two other remarks on this, uh, I, I frequently find inspiring the idea that Hashem refers to uh, the divine mercy, and Elokeinu refers to divine justice. And it, it's, it's a very powerful thing to think about, that I believe that things in my life that I see as tremendous kindnesses from above and the things in my life that it's hard to see where the kindness is, they're coming from the same source. And uh, if you look at it that way, it's powerful that the Elokeinu is bookended by two Hashems. Hashem represents mercy. That even if I can't appreciate it, there's, there's a kindness within what God does for even if I can't see it, even if I'll never understand it. It's something to, to think about, too. Um, Rav Schwab says that if you want an image to think about during the pus this opening Pasuk of Shema, imagine yourself standing at Har Sinai when the Torah was being given, and what's the first commandment? 
Anochi Hashem Melokecha. I am Hashem your God. Isn't that what we're saying? Shema Yisrael, Hashem Melokein. He is our God. What's the second commandment? Lo yeh lecho Elohim achi rima uponai. Don't have any other gods. Hashem echad. Our God is the only God. So it's a remarkable thing to think about. If, if you think about things that way, every time we say the Pasuk of Shema, we're scrolling back to the Har Sinai experience. And remember the famous, again, it's not the only way of understanding the Har Sinai experience, but the, the most popular way of understanding among the commentators is this idea that these two commandments, God heard them from God, uh, Cloud Israel heard them from God himself. These, specifically these two. That's an interesting thing to think about. Um, okay, maybe uh, we'll take just two comments or questions and then we'll keep on going to give you a little bit of a break from listening to my tremendously melodious voice. Um, <laughs> and, any comments or questions? Yeah, Mrs. Some, some people have, in other um, persuasions of Judaism, some people stand for the Shema. And um, most. It's really interesting you mentioned that. It, it's very interesting. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, that was going to be part of the halacha thing, but once you mention it, it's good, so we'll just throw it in here. Um, it's very interesting. The Gemara says that you can say Shema in any position. You're not supposed to say Shema when lying flat on your back or on your stomach, because that's considered to be too, too laid back, literally. Um, um, that's considered a disrespectful. Heaven forbid a person's in the hospital, you know, and they're immobile, you do what you can do. But, but if a person's able to move around, they're not supposed to say Shema. Uh, if a person's already lying down, they can, let's say, turn, turn to their side. That's better than lying on one's back. Uh, but other than that, sitting, standing, walking, technically speaking, it all works for the Shema. Now, there's a famous uh, dispute in the Talmud. It talks about saying Shema when you rise up and saying Shema when you lie down. And there was a dispute between Beis Hillel and Beis Shammai. And Beis Hillel said, that just means that you say it in the time when you rise in the morning the time when you go to bed. That's this idea about the mitzvahs of the times for saying Shema in the morning and at night. Beis Shammai says, no, the halacha is that in the morning Shema you're supposed to say it standing up, and the nighttime Shema you're supposed to say it sitting down. So actually what's considered problem, or lying down, what's considered problematic is specifically doing it that way. So if a person said, well, this is the morning Shema, so since it's the morning Shema, that's why I'm going to stand up. That actually is considered problematic because we that's sort of like going with the wrong opinion. Um, that doesn't mean that, that if a person's davening in a minion and there's nowhere to sit, that or, or davening wherever, there's nowhere to sit, or that they, they're tired. And there's nothing wrong with saying Shema standing, but the point is if they're specifically doing it because it's the morning Shema, that would be problematic. And similarly, to specifically sit down because it's the nighttime Shema, that would be problematic. Um, so it, it, it dovetails a little bit with, with what you're saying. There is an idea that even though technically one can say Shema walking around, the rabbi said the first Pasuk of Shema, one's not allowed to say while walking. The person has to stay in one place for the first, first Pasuk of Shema, because that's, this, as we were saying a moment ago, Shema, that we're, we're told to listen, requires great reflection. And we need to really be focused when we say the first Pasuk of Shema. Yeah, thank you. Um, when I read the first, um, the first verse that we were just saying, it's on the CD, Think of um, what you were saying earlier, like an intimate relationship. It's a kind of Hashem is power God. Yeah. I think of that as a precursor to the first word of the next paragraph, which is uh, no, it's, it's it's getting us in the mood of saying that Hashem is power God. We have an intimate, loving relationship with God that prepares us for being able to accept the command of love. God. Beautiful. Thank you very much. And and the truth is, I'm really glad you made that comment because. Uh, I only framed the personal as, as we better listen to his commandments, but you're right, there's a whole other component here which flows beautifully into loving God. Thank you, thank you very much for that comment. You know, I'll, we're gonna keep on moving for now, I'm sorry, and, and um, sorry, okay. Um, now, the next thing that happens is, is also uh, a bit perplexing. By the way, there's a halachic concept, and it's encouraged in halacha, that the, this first pasuk should be said out loud. All of the words of Shema are supposed to be said loud enough, are supposed to be enunciated, by the way, not just read. Again, heaven forbid if a person can't speak, all you can do is, is, is do your best, but, uh, but if a person, thank God, is able to speak, um, the mitzvah is to actually enunciate the words loud enough that you yourself can hear what you're saying. 
But specifically, the first pasuk, uh, it's not an obligation, but there's an idea of saying it out loud. And many times a person goes to shul, and it is said out loud. Specifically, by the way, the chazan is supposed to be said the first pasuk of Shema out loud. And it's a way to whether focus the, the intent of other people, whether focus ourselves. There's an idea of saying it out loud. All of a sudden, we said that first pasuk out loud, or we did or we didn't. And all of a sudden, we start whispering, uh, Baruch Shem. You almost think that like it must have been some strange minute that somebody said Shema too loud every day and they told him to shush so we whispered the next line. I mean, you know, like, but that clearly is not is not what's going on. Um, it's also somewhat perplexing that we say Baruch Shem in the first place. We talk about that Shema is this beautiful uh, set of psukim from the Torah. Look it up. It doesn't say Baruch Shem. It doesn't say that verse after the Shema. And we just stick it in. What's what in the world is going on? So why is Baruch Shem here, and 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 why do we stick this in? And uh, there are two famous quotes from the Talmud about this. Uh, both of them, to be honest, are somewhat perplexing, but we'll, we'll we'll do our best. The first is we made reference before to the story of Yaakov Avinu that uh, when Jacob was on his deathbed, he had his sons gathered around him, and he wanted to make a great revelation to them about the end of days and he had clarity about what he wanted to share with them, and then all of a sudden he lost his clarity, and it was clear to him that God had kind of fogged him in the moment. It must be because he wasn't supposed to share it, and he was very concerned that maybe there was a, one of his children there was not fit to have this information shared. They weren't up to snuff. Remember, by the way, he's the first one of the patriarchs to have all of the children really stay on the path. Right? Avram didn't have it. Yitzchak didn't have it. But he had it. And that's the beauty of the 12 tribes. Um, so he was very concerned. And they said to him, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Hear Israel, again, referring to as a person, Hashem is our God. Hashem is one. We all recognize him as the God. And in, in the Gemara's rendition, at that point, he responded with, wonderful. Baruch Shem Kvod Machusol Yolom Boed. Let the name of the glory of his kingdom be blessed forever and ever. So this was his response. When Moshe <coughs> shares this beautiful tefillah with the Jewish people in the Torah, in, in Parshas Vos Hanan, he doesn't say Baruch Shem. When Yaakov has the story, he says Baruch. Mara says, so we're stuck. We're going to take the Moshe route or the Yaakov route. If you take the Moshe route, you should omit Baruch Shem. It doesn't say it in the Torah. If you take the Yaakov route, recreating his experience of Shema, you should say Baruch Shem. So Kumara says, again, it's a very good Jewish answer. We'll compromise. Whisper it. Okay, that's, that's uh, one approach. Um, now, of course, Besides even understanding what, what's, what's the Medrash really getting at anyway. So why would it be? Why would it be that Moshe wouldn't say it and Yaakov would say what's that? What's that about? Hopefully we'll, we'll touch on that in a few moments. There's another uh, rendition of the Gemara that says, you know, there's an idea of Moshe kind of going up high to be taught the aspects of the Torah. And then he came to uh, speak with God and understand things. And that Moshe heard the angels say, Baruch Shem, this, this line. And he took that back down to share with the Jewish people. But imagine a simpleton going and breaking into the king's palace and walking out with the most wonderful piece of jewelry. And the person brings, brings it back uh, to his spouse. So Kamara says, so what's he, what, what are they going to do? She can't wear it around because then everyone will know that it was stolen from the king's palace. It doesn't fit. So, in the privacy of their own home, she can wear it. So the Gemara says that's the mushal that Moshe, quote unquote, stole this from the angels, kind of took this out of the angels' uh, book, so to say, out of the angels' prayer book. But we don't proclaim it out loud, we whisper it. Except, of course, for one day a year, Yom Kippur, when we're like, we're like the angels. So we, we, we can do it then. Also, very difficult to understand what in the world this is about. Starting with the second one. What's clearly being said is there's some, it must be that there's something about the, the phrase of Baruch Shein that we as flawed people have no right stating this verse. 
and the angels as the perfect servants of God can proclaim the verse. And so we would like to proclaim the verse every day, but it's a chutzpah. Well, who do you think you are? We, we relate to God as these perfect servants of God, and we say the line that only the perfect servants of God can say, we're so flawed. Yeah, you're in the middle of davening. Did you, did you come to davening on time? Did you say all the words of davening? Are you focused? I mean, like, who are you kidding? So we want to say it, but we don't want to be chutzpah dick, so we, we whisper it. And Yom Kippur, we really are cleansed. We really are, at least for the day, perfect, so to say. So we can say it. Oh, okay. Um, it seems that part of the idea here is, it's very interesting, just take a look at the words. Baruch means it, it should be abundant, like we explained when we talked in Shmona Esrei. Uh, let, let, let the honor of God be abundant. Shame, the name of the honor of his kingdom. Let the name of the honor of his kingdom be abundant. So there's a lot of layers here of things about God's glory. Honor and name is how he's viewed, and Baruch, it should be abundant. Forever and ever. It's, it's really saying the same thing in like three different ways. And it's clearly an expression of yearning for the abundance of God's honor. Uh, so I once had a thought that we were so flawed. How, how could we have the chutzpah to say something like that? Yeah, it, it's, it's, your, it's your passionate will that the, the, the glory of God should always be abundant. If it was really our passionate will, we wouldn't find it so easy to sin. It's not our passionate will. Every now and then, we, we, it is our passionate will, but generally it's not. But we would like to be in that place where it's our passionate will. So we say it as a reflection of where we would like to be. But we feel it's a chutzpah to say it. So we whisper it. Except that no can work. Yaakov was in a different situation than Moshe. Yaakov was at the end of his life. There's a, there's a, there's a famous idea that when a person wishes another person a farewell, not for what forever, but just to have a nice trip, the, the, the phrasing is leich le shalom. Go to peace towards peace. Uh, traditionally, when a person passes away, we say to them, Leich Bishalom. Go in peace or with peace. What's the difference between towards peace and with peace? It's a famous understanding. It's so famous, I have no idea to whom to attribute the idea. <laughs> I'm sure it's from someone. I apologize for not having a name. That Shalom, which we translate as peace, is also related to the word Shalem, complete. Life is about trying to find completion in our service of God. So, if, 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 I, if I have a meeting with you, and then you're going, and going on a trip, whatever it is, I say to you, keep on going, le shalom, towards completion. <clears throat> I wish you success in your continuing journey of, 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 of meeting completion in your life. At the end of someone's life, the hope is they've reached their completion. So Yaakov Avinu can say at the end of his life, my, my greatest desire is that the glory of God be increased. Here it is, he's on his deathbed. And his children all say to him, Shema Yisrael Hashem Lokeinu Hashem Echad. There are numerous sources within the story of Yaakov that see it as his unique mission to be able to proclaim that all of his children stayed on the path. Again, he had a unique role as one of the patriarchs. So at the end of his life, he can say, my, my dream of, 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 of this glory of heaven, I, I've accomplished my dream. He can say it. Moshe Rabbeinu is, 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 is alive and well when he teaches the Jewish people the Shema. It's a chutzpah for him to say it too. Because no one's complete. Hopefully, at the end, someone is complete. It's not a thought of possibility. Okay, um, that's very late. Uh, just uh, briefly, just again, an image. So Rav Schwab gave us an image during Shema Yisrael to think of oneself at Har Sinai and to just reflect on the fact that it's like I'm standing at Har Sinai, hearing from God these first two commandments and then concurring with them. Shema Yisrael, Shemokin Hashem Echad. So for Baruch Shem, he gives us another, another image to think about. 
Besides in the Shema of Yom Kippur, we also, another time during the davening, say Baruch Shem out loud. In the Yom Kippur Musaf, we bow down on the ground to recreate what would happen in, in the Beis HaMikdash, in the Temple on Yom Kippur. We say out loud, as they did, Baruch Shem, this line. So he says, imagine every time a person whispers the line Baruch Shem, they think to themselves that at this moment, it's my desire to serve God like the image of the person prostrated on the ground of the temple on Yom Kippur. And that was all of Cloud Israel would bow down on the ground and, and proclaim Baruch Shem. And that's how I would like to be every time I say the Shema and I whisper the line of Baruch Shem afterwards. And, and, and he says, by the way, the image of bowing on the ground of the temple is that here you have this physical place that its very being is rooted in the sanctity of the service of God. It only is a special place because the divine presence dwells there. The entire building of it was totally inspired by the service of God. And here I am, I bow down on the ground. My body, my physical body becomes one with the physical core and being of this temple because I'm completely devoted to God in this moment. And that's not saying we should bow on the ground every time we say Shema. But, but just, just to, to, to kind of bring us there, if, if, if some of us do very well with images. So this is an image for Baruch Shem, something to think about. Okay. Okay, um, let's go on. Let's turn the page. Okay. We have to ace Hashem you should love Hashem your God, with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your might, energy. Okay. There's a lot to say here. We'll try to streamline it a little bit. You have to, you should love Hashem. And this very much fits with what Aaron spoke about earlier. We're talking here about a greater plane than serving God on out of reverence, or serving God out of, gosh, I hope if I do those mitzvahs, things will be good for me. Serving God out of a sense of love. And this is the ultimate level. And if I'm on this spiritual charge of Hashem, Elokein, Hashem, Echad, and Baruch Shem, now I proclaim the sense that my goal is to serve God from a place of love. I might not be there, but my goal is to be there. When we say that we love God, what does it mean that we love God? So the famous Sefer Chovos Halvavos, literally translated as the duties of the heart, says that we could love God for three reasons, and obviously it's all of the above. <coughs> Generally speaking, the love is an expression of our appreciation of God, of our, of our gratitude to God. So the first thing for which we should be grateful is the fact that He created us. The very fact that He created us, we should be so grateful for that fact. The second thing for which he should be grateful, which we should be grateful, is the fact that not only did he give us life in this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful world, but he gave us life in this wonderful world as part of the Jewish people. Certainly for those who are born into the Jewish people, and for those who have come to the Jewish people of, of, of their own initiative, the fact that they had the wisdom, the fact that they had the opportunity, the fact that they met the right people along the way, the fact that they had <coughs> that understanding of self and knowledge of self to make that tremendous decision. We should be so grateful to God one way or the other for that. And finally, the fact that not only did he put us in this world, and not only did he make us part of the Jewish people, but he, he created us with this capacity to have this eternal spiritual meaning through the world to come. That I, you know, and, and, that, and by the way, by extension, the fact that I have so much meaning in this world, it's always, it's always a remarkable thing. We discussed it during the Tefillah Siddish Monastery series also. Again, I, I, don't, I don't mean this in any way that we're better than anyone else. We're not better than anyone else. But we're so lucky, we're so fortunate, uh, you know, Walk, walk, walk out of your walk out of your house in the morning. Yeah. For those of us who still have non-Jewish neighbors in Kent Mill, a few of us still do. Uh, you know, just look. Uh, you know, we have so much. 
we have so much opportunity for meaning any moment, any moment. We're so fortunate. We have so much mission. We have so much quest. We're, but why? I, what did I do to deserve this? I, I was just born into it. People who made the own decision, they have more of a right to be proud of themselves for making that decision. A schlepper like me, I was just born into it. I was so fortunate. We have so much meaning in our lives. And, 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 and you know what? And there's a lot of times that we take a step back and say, why couldn't things be easier? Why do we have all these commandments? Okay, fine. But we have so much meaning. And if we can reflect on that a little bit, we should be so grateful, especially because Hashem Echad, God is, is the, this is where it's all at. I'll give you a very, a very simplistic mushroom for a moment. Very simplistic. Lahavda, lahavda, not to compare this to what it is to have a relationship with God. Um, I, I, I have a, a relative who uh, went to study in the yeshiva years ago, and he became a very, very close uh, you know, student of, of, a, of a certain Rosh Hashiva, of a certain dean of an institution. It was an extremely, it actually wasn't even a yeshiva. It was like a little group of people learning in a basement or somewhere. And I remember thinking to myself, well, but okay, good for him. He he's finds this to be very, uh, you know, very meaningful. And I guess the person's a brilliant scholar and, and a good teacher, but okay, fine. You know, there's a lot of yeshivas out there. Turns out that he, he picked well because, because this, this teacher of his today is, is like one of the most respected Torah scholars around. And you try to call him, good luck, because he's in such great demand. But this person wants to call him. What do you mean? He's his close student. They have, they have a relationship of spanning decades. And they're, they're close. It's, it's, it's no, you know, I guess, easy contact, easy access. So, like, imagine if we really believe that Hashem Echad, and one of the ways of understanding is the day will come where all of the world recognizes that it's all about God. The day will come where everyone recognizes that. So, Forgive the phrase, we're getting it on the ground floor here. We should feel very fortunate. It's something to, to think about a little bit. Um, there is uh, the beautiful uh, Shabbos project. Is the Shabbos. I, I should mention another famous chat in the mitzvah of the Ahavta Hashem Lokach. You should love Hashem for God. There's a rabbi who says this. They are, you have a commandment to see to it. To, to facilitate that other people should have the opportunity to love God. You know, there's this beautiful, beautiful idea of reaching out to others who are less knowledgeable about Judaism than we are. So the question is posed, what's the, where's the mitzvah of the Torah to do it? It's very nice. Where's the mitzvah of the Torah? So some say, what do you mean? It's right here. That the, the greatest way for me to love God, the greatest expression of my love of God, is I know He treasures His relationship with others, to, to help strengthen those bonds to others. This is something interesting to think about. Okay. So now we say, the Yishalah Hashem, your God, we, we will not go past 9 o'clock. Let's just at least finish this puzzle. Now, how would you say your heart? Libcha. Your heart. Levavcha, there's like an extra vet in there. It's a little bit strange. So many understand Lubavcha is literally translated as being your hearts. Most of us only have one heart. <laughs> so uh, the Midrashic understanding is this refers to both inclinations. Both, the, both inclinations, both the Yetzir Tov and the Yetzir Ra. The good inclination, that which makes us, which spurs us to do good things, and that which uh, brings us challenges and desires to do not as good things. So we're saying we should serve God with both, with both inclinations. I know how to serve God with my inclination to do good. How do I serve God with my inclination to do bad? I just want to share with you two ideas. The Rashba says that, what does it mean that we have an evil inclination? What it means is, I have a burning desire sometimes. Standing here, I walk by the McDonald's, really hungry. I know it's not kosher. So some people might have a burning desire to, 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 to get that, that burger from McDonald's. Okay, thank you. Um, um, so the Rashba says, imagine if I could channel my burning desire towards the service of God. That's the highest plane. If I really, really love God, then it shouldn't just be that, I know it's right for me to, to, to invite that person over. I, I, know, I know it's right for me to study that Torah. 
It should be, I want to do it. And I can't think of anything else at the moment other than doing that, what the Rashba says. Rav Hirsch says a really nice thought. Rav Hirsch says, every time I have a temptation to do something inappropriate, and I somehow overcome the temptation. And you know what? I don't bat a thousand. There are times where I fail. But every now and then, when I rise to the occasion and I overcome the temptation, that was a tremendous moment of serving God. And in a sense, I was serving God with my evil inclination. It's, it's a very powerful thing to think about because we, we're, we're too inclined to view things in the absolute terms. And if I was tempted five times and I succumbed four times, we say to ourselves, what a terrible rate. And there is room for improvement, that's clear. But what a, what, a, what a great thing that I overcame my temptation once. Let's serve a God with my evil inclination. That's what first says. Okay. B'chol nafshecha, and with all of my life, with all of my soul, the traditional understanding is what the Gemara says, even if my life is, is, is at risk. And, right? So many people through our generations, you know, who said, okay, the, the, leave your religion for the sake of your life. We are mitzvah. In certain circumstances, at least, is to give up our life, maybe, depending on the circumstances. Uvechom ma'odecha. Ma'odecha could mean all of your money. It's even if it means that losing one's assets for the sake of the service of God. If that's what it takes, that's what it takes. As many in our, in our history have done such a thing. Just, I want to share two other ideas. The Gemara says, or I believe it's from the Gemara, Rashi brings it down. It's a little bit of a play on words. Ma'udecha could be a reference to midah. Midah is a measure. And whatever God gives me in life, we're not talking about midah's like character right now. We mean like whatever measure God doles out to me. Sometimes God gives me tremendous blessing. I have to find a way to serve God within that blessing. I have to recognize God within that blessing. Sometimes God gives me tremendous challenge. I have to find a way to serve God despite the challenge and maybe even channel the challenge. Um, one more idea is from Rav Schwab. He says, let's translate it literally. Ma'odecha, so again, it could be resources. It could be what God throws your way. Find a way to serve him throughout it. Or it could be your ma'od. Ma'od means very much. We all have strengths. We all have unique aspects of our personalities. We all have something that's ma'od. Some of us it might be our sense of humor. Some of us it might be our sense of responsibility. It could be anything. Find what your own ma'od is, what your own unique aspect is, and find a way to channel that in serving God. So again, the point is, whether it be in our own personal challenges, in our struggles within ourselves, within our heart, whether it be, heaven forbid, if our life is at stake, whether it be with our resources or with our talents, we have to find a way to serve God. And the model is from a sense of ava, from a sense of love. Hey, it is 9 o'clock. We'll pick up from here next week. We'll try to get a little bit of a move on. Thank you very much for joining us. But again, if I can, if I can ask people, let's try as a group. For anyone who thinks this is meaningful, and we won't take attendance on it next week, but let's try as a group once a day to just reflect on the bracha of Goel Yisrael. Which one Israel, and think about the situation of Israel. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good night. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.